I'm going to make sure that uh, that Gavin is uh, is here. Hello, Gavin, and welcome. Hi, John. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, I'll just wait until you've shared your your screen. Sure. Let me do that. Okay, you should be able to see it fine now. Yes, we can see it. Just uh, one thing, there's a little um, bar okay. at the bottom there. If you can click the hide, that's great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Gavin, <clears throat> the CEO of Brick. And Brick is really a financial data API provider for Southeast Asia. Being a financial infrastructure builder for Southeast Asia, we have many thoughts on how the future of finance might look like in Southeast Asia. So today, I will be sharing some of our thoughts on the future of hyper-personalized financial services in Southeast Asia. Before we talk about all the exciting things about financial services and fintech, let's take a step back to discuss how successful brands look like today. If we think of the biggest technology brands globally today, brands like Amazon, Shopify, Netflix, Google, one common thread comes through. The services that these tech companies provide are all instant, relevant, and personalized. Amazon brought this experience of instant, relevant, and personalized to end users in the commerce vertical. Spotify did it for music, Netflix did it for media, and Google did it for information. This trend of instant and hyper-personalized services is happening to every industry, and we at Brick think that this is coming to financial services. And if we look at financial services today, right, the words instant and hyper-personalized would not come to mind. Not too long ago, before COVID, many of us would have to go to the bank branches often to obtain financial services or to complete the purchase of a financial product. Right? COVID has improved the situation a little bit, but even today, going to the bank branch to complete and purchase a financial product is an un unavoidable fact of life. But things are changing in Southeast Asia. So if, you, if we look at Indonesia, things are definitely becoming more digital. And this really starts off first from uh, money becoming more digital and commerce becoming more digital. When these core pieces become more digital, it means that tech companies then have access to more digital data to offer and power hyper-personalized services. So if we look at a few trends, in December last year, more than $22 trillion was processed in e-money transactions alone. COVID has also accelerated this trend, both for e-money transactions and e-commerce transactions have grown to more than 150 million transactions in September 2020 alone. All these trends help power the high fintech growth in Indonesia with more than 220% growth in fintech companies in the year 2020. So what we see and believe at Brick is there's a huge shift from supply-driven to demand-driven services, led first by other industries, and now this is coming to the financial services industry. Right? Uh, supply-driven in Supply-driven uh, services in the past means that it's typically led by the manufacturer of the services. Um, the newscasters who produce the news control distribution. And that was why they controlled and dictated what type of services should be provided. The same for many other different industries. But today, consumers have choices and companies need to listen to what consumers want. This has given rise to aggregators 
who provide demand-driven services. So if we look at in the year 1990, uh, most of financial services is provided through bank branches. Right? The bank crafts the financial product, dictates how this financial product should look like, what is the criteria for somebody who qualifies to buy this product, and also decides how this product should be distributed. Right? As we move across the years, we see the rise of online banking in the year 2000. And in the last five years in Southeast Asia, there has been a huge boom in fintech apps. We at Brick think that the year of 2020 is now the year for personalized finance. And what all this means, what demand really means is really that we should build what our users want. In a nutshell, this is what we mean when we talk about hyper-personalized personalized financial services. And now let's take a look at how hyper-personalized financial services might look for different financial services verticals. For example, savings, lending, investing, etc. Right. In the past, for savings accounts, you would typically have one main savings account with a fixed interest rate, which is granted to you after you met certain criteria. If your financial situation changes, uh, if you're saving more money and you want to obtain a higher interest rate, you would likely have to abandon that account and apply for a new account at a different bank. This leads to churn, high amounts of user churn for customers, for, for banks and financial service providers. In the future, with the availability of data on their users, financial services providers can now offer adaptable savings accounts for example, multiplier accounts that are able to adapt to the changing saving behavior of their customers and offer different um, benefits as the financial behavior, as the income and expense behavior of their users change. Another thing that's possible would also be automated and suggested savings goals. For example, your bank would be able to uh, notice that you're saving up for certain loan repayments or for a holiday at the end of the year. And they can automatically create a savings pot for that holiday that's coming in three or six months. For the lending space, what's typically offered to users today is a fixed interest loan product. Uh, if your financial situation improves and you would like to have a product of lower interest rates again you would probably have to leave your current financial services provider and go look for a new one right leading to churn for the lender in the future what we see powered by personal data is a future of multi-variable credit decision making where financial service providers and lenders will be able to lend to underserved segments whose data today might not exist in credit bureaus. Another possibility would be the offering of variable credit lines, which can adapt to the customer's financial behavior. If the customer is earning more revenue in a certain month, reducing their expenses on, uh, on unimportant financial spending, the credit line can be increased to reflect that reduced risk on the customer side. Lastly, I'll quickly cover how hyper-personalized investments might look like. Right now, when you want to make an investment, most of us would go to a financial advisor. The financial advisor would look at the past 5, 10 years of our data and come up with an investment plan. This investment plan is usually not touched and not tweaked until the next review, typically in one or two years time. Right? But our financial behavior, our financial situation will be constantly changing in this one to two years. 
And what would be a much better scenario for most of us is just-in-time investment advice and portfolio rebalancing that changes together with changes in our income and expenses. So those are some examples of how hyper-personalized financial products might look like in different finance verticals. And the big question then today is, what can business and tech leaders of fintechs and financial services companies, or even consumer tech companies that are increasingly offering financial products to their end users do today to harness this change and this trend of hyper-personalized financial services? There are a few things leaders like yourself can do. Uh, firstly, we should start harnessing the data that's available to us. Right? These data can be from your existing user base or external data. Right? We should sit down, uh, identify what data is available internally and externally, and start tracking this data, which brings me to my second point. Don't leave it to chance. We have to start tracking this data so that we can make use of this data. Put things like a data warehousing strategy at the forefront of your organization strategy. And lastly, think about becoming a hub for your user data, right? allowing your users to link other accounts to your platform or your app so that you can get a more holistic view of your users' financial behavior and financial health. In this trend of linking accounts to your platform is powered by uh, numerous open banking and open finance providers, somebody like Brick, and could really supercharge your understanding, conversion, and retention of your users. So that brings me to the end of my short presentation on how the future of hyper-personalized financial services might possibly look like for Southeast Asia. Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, Gavin. Um, so I have a few questions, actually. Um, I think that what you paint in terms of the possibilities for, um, for personalization in financial services sound, um, uh, sound, sound really interesting and marketers um, in financial services and in, in other companies are constantly looking for ways that uh, they can treat uh, their customers, not as these broad uh, segments and, and, and personas, but as, but as individuals. But I, I guess the question I would have for you is how can uh, financial services firms um, enable uh, and build the uh, the capability to actually personalize because um, I, I would think that a lot of this depends on their on their digital maturity or particularly their data maturity um, mm. because the, the a financial institution may have a lot of information about a customer but they don't really have it all in one place at the point at which at that moment of truth when mm. Uh, they're engaging with a customer. So a customer goes into a branch or goes onto the website or uses their app or mm -hmm. uses a partner application. And at that point, that they're, they're starting to interact with the institution, but the institution doesn't necessarily have everything, mm -hmm. um, all their resources focused mm -hmm. on that interaction. So what are the, the sorts of things that they need to do in order to get to that to that point? Yeah, great question, John. And uh, it's really a question that uh, we can have a huge discussion about. So really how to harness data firstly, and then how to make use of this data that you're getting. So how to harness data is really um, the first core pillar of the open banking movement globally, which is now also happening in Southeast Asia. Uh, regulators are moving very quickly on that front in countries like Singapore, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, to implement open API standards, standardize API standards so that companies can easily share uh, data with each other. Or to put it specifically, so that end users can safely and securely share their data from uh, 
one particular app to another app, right? And all this is being simplified by uh, financial data aggregators, companies like Plaid in the US, TrueLayer in Europe, and uh, companies like Brick for Southeast Asia. So really, that's just the first layer, the data access layer. Uh, once you get that data from another account linked to your app, you have, and many, many other accounts as well, you have a lot of data. Then now what do you do with that data to turn them into insights, to power hyper-personalized financial services? That's when you either have to build in-house data science capabilities, or increasingly many of these uh, financial data aggregators are also building pre-built insights APIs or data science modules uh, for different use cases. Uh, for example, credit scoring module, uh, income identification module, income verification module, smart categorization module, etc., and so on and so forth. So, so this is offering um, products or services accessible through through APIs. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So uh, I guess that that comes into well, there, there are a lot of aspects to um, developing uh, APIs as as products or to serve up uh, products, and we'll, we'll be hearing from speakers from different industries about that. Some of them associated with data, uh, some of them associated with telecommunications or uh, or, or payments or uh, other financial services. I guess what. Um, what would be interesting to understand a little bit is about well, for an open API that is related to financial services, what are the um, uh, what are the approval processes that you need to go through uh, with, for example, OJK in order to uh, make sure that you can you are you are authorized in a, in a regulated environment to to offer um, uh, information or use customers' uh, personal information in order to facilitate that personalization? Yeah. So in terms of the regulatory side of things, uh, there is that upcoming personal data protection bill in Indonesia uh, about to be passed by the Indonesian parliament anytime now. Uh, that requires uh, somebody collecting users' data to get the express consent of their user before uh, collecting that data and storing it or passing it on to a third party. Right? Uh, in terms of practical processes, what typically needs to be done before you connect, you are able to connect to the data source is first commercial negotiations with that data source. For example, a bank, a wallet, a telco, a super app, etc. Once commercial negotiations are done, you would get access to their APIs and API keys, uh, do that development, do tech standardization for your platform, data standardization, so that the data you're getting is in the same format as uh, how data is currently stored in your platform. Right? And this process has to be repeated for every new data source that you are um, linking to. So what um, again, another plug for Brick. I don't mean to do this, but uh, so what financial data aggregators like Brick does is connect with each of these data sources individually so that we handle the commercial negotiations uh, so that you don't have to. And we deal with all the different tech standards for all the different data sources, deal with the data standardization for all the different data sources, and also the ongoing maintenance whenever the data source updates their APIs, uh, typically an update needs to be done on your site as well. Right? If you connect to a data aggregator or data layer like Brick, uh, no maintenance is required on your end. So we do the heavy lifting on the infrastructure side of things, uh, combine it as a unified API so that uh, no maintenance, little work is required by you. You can go live in as soon as an afternoon and focus on building a great user experience instead of uh, spending your time and resources building all these individual connections with different data sources. Okay, that's, that's very, very interesting. Thanks for that insight. I, I guess what, um, what you're sort of saying is that you can start to uh, abstract away um, some of that complexity 
by by creating these these layers, uh, exposing them them through APIs. But what what I picked up on from from that was that there are actually a lot of people you need permission from to use the data. So you need um, it, it, if it's a um, being a, a regulated industry, financial in, um, uh, approval to launch a financial product or service <clears throat> needs to be gained from uh, OJK in the, in the case of, of Indonesia. And then <clears throat> if the financial institution um, is um, wants to abstract away some of that complexity by dealing with, with BRIC or um, an aggregator, then that um, then that organisation also needs to have uh, have permission to be able to use that data. And then, of course, if you're dealing with a, a non financial partner or or a fintech that doesn't have a, a banking license, then then they also need to gain uh, permission to use the data. And of course, is the the customer that uh, you ultimately need to gain uh, their permission to to use that data. So uh, encouraging um, encouraging people to do that. Um, what what do you see as sort of the, the mechanisms? Because when whenever people talk about um, privacy um, mm -hmm. data, I mean we're all revealing information online about mm -hmm. ourselves all the time. But when it comes to actually where's where's my money going? What, what's in my identity? Um, mm -hmm. What are the sorts of things that um, financial services firms can do to encourage um, to, to reassure customers that they're going to make um, proper use of that of that data um, and, and that information and that they're, they're not going to abuse it and they're not going to hand it off to, to unauthorized mm -hmm. parties. Yeah, yeah, very good question. So I would say for users like you and me, um, most users in Southeast Asia are already comfortable with sharing their data and do it on a regular basis. Uh, the success rates of, of a particular pool of user deciding to share their data or not will really depend on the value add and convenience they get on the other side uh, once after they have shared the data. So if it's a huge value add, they're getting huge convenience in terms of uh, not doing manual uh, document submission processes, more likely than not, these customers would be happy to share their data. Some things that um, financial services firms can do to, uh, to reassure their users and to increase the number of users willing to share their data is to be super clear about the process. So first, having uh, laying out very cl clearly what are the categories of data that you will be collecting on the collect consent collection page. So when the user is giving uh, consent for their, you, their data to be shared, they know exactly what they are agreeing to. Once that is done, we should also have a clear um, consent revocation process. So if the user no longer wants to share the data or would like to request for their data to be deleted from your database, there's a simple process that they can go through to effect that change. So really, um, clarity, transparency, simple processes for end users will increase their confidence a lot in uh, being willing to share data. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for for sharing those those insights into what we can expect and how companies can prepare for the the future of, of hyper personalized uh, finance. Thanks very much, Gavin. Thank you so much, John.